And welcome to the Investor Coaching Show. I am Paul Winkler. Talking about the world of money and investing, along with Evan Barnard here. Howdy. Providing the ice cream. There you go. <laughs> and Ira Work. What did you what are you bringing? <laughs> oh no. He's, bringing, got a, he's, he's got, I got invitations. I got another invitation. Invitations to steak dinners for No, this is a steak this is a steak lunch. Steak lunch. I guess they're cheaper than steak dinners. Steak dinner, steak lunch. Hey, you know what? It's um it, it's I, more annuity stuff, right? I would think. Yeah, probably. We're going to talk about it a little bit. Yeah, we'll talk about it. We'll get to that. So, guys, watching TV this week, the thing that got me was, and there's just a lot to talk about, but the thing that got me was this one thing that came up. This guy that runs a large investment firm who shall remain nameless, because it doesn't really matter what firm this guy runs, uh, does this little segment, right? Uh Uh-huh. And they're asking about his investment, you know, what he does and, and, you know, the whole thing about, you know, the way you manage money should be what, what, now what's the reason when we manage money for an investor, kind of what should we be thinking about? The investor. investor. (laughs) We should be making sure that we take care of them and do what, as best we can do what is in their best interest. But, you know, it's a very loose term. Because you can do just about anything, quote unquote, in somebody's best interest, as we've talked about, you know, that you can you can engage in some crazy activity and it still be considered a fiduciary responsibility being upheld. So what happens is fund companies, they're out there, they're advertising. We're great. We do these lovely things. We take care of our investors. And, you know, we're an own, you're an owner. Uh, you know, they have all kinds of nice little phrases that sound really, really good. Uh-huh. But when it gets down to it, I couldn't believe that this guy was actually honest about what he was doing. And he, here's basically what he said. Yeah. Our job... As you said it, Jim, is to provide choice for every client. It is not our money. 100% of the money we manage is our client's money. And we invest for them under their mandates, under their wishes. We are not political. Everything we do is on behalf of our clients and clients' needs. Uh, And if somebody in in a state that is more progressive and wants us to invest in one way, we will do that. And if you you have a more conservative view and you believe that is the right thing to do for your for your beneficiaries, we will be doing that on their behalf. No, no. So what did we miss there? (laughs) There was nothing about the investor. It's whatever you want. Well, we'll give you what you want. (laughs) Give the people what they want, regardless whether it's good for them. Number one. Who is he also talking about investing for? Not the little mom and pop investor. They're screwing up entire state portfolios, these monster portfolios, and just doing whatever they want. And the reality of it is, the end investor is, you know, the pension, you know, the investor that is uh, in the pension plan is getting hosed by this, obviously. Okay, I might have misunderstood what he was saying then. I... I got the sense listening to that yeah. clip that he was saying people that live in more progressive states might want to have more progressive portfolios. Is he a pension manager that was well, talking they, they, about state money? Yes, they they manage. Oh, wow. It was both. Okay. Yeah. So you, yeah, that's that's a good point. So <laughs> so it's not only people. People may use the fund company because this particular fund company. They're huge, and they manage money for both state pensions, governments, yeah. and individuals. Okay, so they it's it runs the gamut. But the reality of it was is that you know what you look at here is so often in a state you think well a pension plan they ought to be really super sophisticated they ought to be you know yeah. managing by academic standards and certainly they have a fiduciary responsibility right and that's what I hate about the term fiduciary it is just a broad term that means nothing and you can do just about anything people's money and still be considered a quote-unquote fiduciary and that is what we hear advertised in the national markets a lot yeah it'd be nice to go back to uniform prudent investor act yeah i mean that's a legit standard that 
yeah. has some consistency. Yeah, yeah. The American Law Institute, Restatement of Law. What does it say about managing money? And, you know, you see all of this stuff. Don't it pick says, stocks. <laughs> yeah, is it market efficiency? And economic evidence shows from a typical investment perspective, the major capital markets are highly efficient and blah, blah, blah. You know, all these efforts to beat the market uh, ordinarily promises little or no payoff or even a negative payoff after taking into account research and transaction cost. And you know what? It says, in fact, evidence shows that there's little correlation between a fund manager's performance in their earlier successes and their ability to produce above market returns in subsequent periods. So, you know, stock picking market time, you can do that. Technically, we can get by with it. Right. But, you know, it's like it's an uphill climb, guys. Uh, I think you're you're really you're you're rowing against the uh, the current to try to do this. Mm -hmm. But you can do it. And that's the problem. That's what you run into. Now, I, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm wondering because I was listening to what he said. Yes. And I'm wondering if that he might have a disclosure that he has the trustees or the investment committee sign that says, you know, being that you want to eliminate, like, let's say the California state pension plan. I don't know if this is fact or not, but just a hypothetical to go with me on this. We don't want any companies that do not follow the green initiative. So we don't want oil companies in there and so forth. We don't yeah, want yes, coal yeah, companies. Yeah, just just to, before you go any further, yes, indeed, that lady was, I also watched an interview with her as well, the one that runs that that pension. So, okay. Yeah. So I'm wondering if they have them sign like a letter of acceptance that because we're avoiding certain stocks, mm -hmm. we might have subpar performance. Uh, n not that I know of. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that that's in there. <laughs> no, but you see what I'm saying? It's like, so that like, let's say if we were to do that, oh, the, right, we're yeah. covering ourselves as fiduciaries yeah. to say that, you know, like if you came into my office as a client, Paul, and said, well, Paul, if this is what you want, you don't want me to invest for you in these certain industries. Right. I want you to sign a letter acknowledging this is what you told me to do. And therefore, if your portfolio doesn't keep up with a minimum of market returns, you're not holding me accountable. Right. Well, that that would be good. Cover their back end that way. But, you know, it's it's interesting because I did actually go and do some research on the pensions uh -huh. out there and we'll do we'll probably do a i don't know video audio i don't know how i'm going to actually release that information uh, in the future but i did look at the california program and uh because it's saying well you know we had pretty good performance and you know there was a negative return and i looked at the negative return it wasn't that bad now they don't go on a calendar year they go on july 1st to june 30th is, is basically what they do and a lot of these pensions do that as well and i looked at the return and over that period of time so i had to actually instead of looking at calendar year i looked at you know that particular period of time and it wasn't so bad you know it wasn't a huge downturn mm -hmm. but what i thought was fascinating and i didn't look at all the years i did look at the year prior and the upward return of the portfolios was way the heck less than i thought it should have been for that period of time right. based on markets around the world. So, and it's probably because of this leaning. We also to have looked at other pension plans yeah. and I haven't been impressed. And what caused me to do it is somebody was asking me about an endowment and saying, Hey, you, do you guys work with endowments? And, and I said, yeah, you know, that's something that we've done. Uh, and you know, because the, the, the perception was that the endowments, because they're sophisticated, they're very large, that they're very well run, well yeah. managed. And I said, hey, guys, let's do some research on this. And let's, And I was, um, I don't guess, I, don't, I really wasn't surprised because we've seen so much research on pension plans right. and how poorly pension plans have been run and how, you know, they... And they typically buy things after they do well, and then you know they do the same things that investment advisors typically do, and the lay public tend to do when they yeah. buy mutual funds. So I wasn't surprised that the returns weren't good, but I don't have overall data, so I'm going to start gathering so just because it's fun, uh, just because it's fun to do that. So yeah, that that is something that will be coming uh, our way in the near future. I thought it was interesting. There are you moving on from that clip, Paul? Yeah, well, yeah, I'm moving on. But well, if you have anything else on it, go ahead. I mean, to me, <laughs> you could do like the whole hour just We probably could. What this guy said. Well, true. So there was two things that really jumped out at me. Sure. One, and it's what he said. You know, I don't know what he meant to say. Right. But he said, 
100% of this is our client's money. And I'm just thinking, okay, well, why aren't you managing your money <laughs> in this same fund? You know, I mean, it it kind of came oh, across as... Oh, I see, as, I see what you're saying. We're not... Why are you I'm not, not eating your this. own cooking? This is, this is 100% client money. Yeah, know? why are you not eating your own cooking? Exactly. That kind of thing. Yeah, sure. Okay. And then kind of to Ira's point, <laughs> talking about kind of the disclosure language. Yeah. I was thinking about my relationship with Cindy, and you could put your you know, His your wife wife's name in place like with any of this discussion. Uh-huh. Well, you know, I'm going to have you sign this letter that when I'm traveling out of town, we don't have to remain faithful to each other, you know, and I only have to remain faithful when the market's up this year and we're intended. I mean, that's basically what he's saying is I believe this, but you know, Hey, if we want to deviate, yeah. let's just do that. I'm, it's ludicrous to think that, but well, sure. that's what's going on with Well, would firms. you go to your doctor and yeah. say, you know, I just whatever, you know, I, I know that you have all this medical knowledge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, I found, I, I, but, I, but I found something on Google Yeah, <laughs> when I was looking up the problems. Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. I, I hear that all the time. <laughs> I had a doctor that, that uh, he's a, he's a, a doc uh, internal medicine guy mm-hmm. that I was uh, was working with, and he goes, oh man, he goes, you have no idea how many times Dr. Google shows up in my office. <laughs> yeah, I saw a sign that said, do, do not mm-hmm. confuse your Google search with my medical degree. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. But you know, if you think about what that guy was saying, mm-hmm. that would be like a, Somebody like us Mm -hmm. saying to the client, well, if you call me up and tell me you want to get out of the market, I'll do that. Right. And I'll wait for you to say, get back in the market. And the only reason any advisor would do that, as opposed to coaching like we do and, you know, keeping you an investor on the right path. The only reason an advisor would do that is so that, number one, they could keep the account. Sure. And number two have the opportunity to sell perhaps another commission at a later date. You know, and, and it's, it's so true. And, and the other thing is you think about mutual fund companies in general. You know, so if we look at mutual fund companies, you know, like a Fidelity or Vanguard, they'll have multiple funds, you know, nine, 10 funds. I don't even know how many funds yeah. that they'll have that. And, and sometimes the bigger they are, the more they have that will be investing in one area of the market. Mm hmm. You know, like, let, let's say you take large U.S. stocks, you have 500 companies and you have 500 companies to choose from. Well, you might just want to have one fund that invests in those companies. Right. That's it. You don't need any more than one fund, but you'll have eight, nine, ten, you know, a dozen funds investing in one area of the market. But they're just slightly different from each other. And you go, well, why does a fund company do that? Well, they do that because if one fund does just a little bit better than this one over here, then what we're going to do is we're going to market this fund right here that did a little bit better yep. than the other fund. And then when this fund doesn't perform so well in the future, we'll just switch you back over to this fund or maybe a third fund or a fourth fund that was slightly differently managed. And that is the game that the investing industry plays. That's number one. The second game that you see the investing industry plays is that we know that, you know, trying to go, so let's say we take large U.S. stocks. And since we've got a new producer, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm just going to explain this. There we go. You know, what we've got going on is let's say that you have 500 companies mm-hmm. in the S&P 500, large U.S. stocks. There is a belief out there that says, well, it doesn't make sense to own all of those companies. There may be 50 of them that are really good, that have great promise. (laughs) And what we want to do is the other 450, we don't want to own right now. We'll own those 50. And then when they've had their run, we'll move to the other 50 that's going to be the next really good companies. And that is the concept of stock picking. When people invest, they think, hey, I like doing business with this company. I think they're really good. They assume that that company will have a higher return than other companies like it. That's the idea. And what you're also assuming, you don't think about it this way, is that the companies you really like and that you think are really, really good are just dying to pay you more money to use your money. Yeah. It's just illogical if you think about it. That doesn't make any sense. But yet that is what sells on Wall Street. 
So what happens is you have this idea of we're going to be able to tell you which areas of the market, when to move between areas of the market, we can get higher returns. A fund company that really had a backbone when it comes to philosophy should just go, either we just completely believe that stock picking and market timing is a great way of going, mm -hmm. or that we should not engage in that process. And that's it. They shouldn't have both types of funds. Yes. And, and they shouldn't have more than one stock in any of their funds. Well, that's true. I mean, that's going to the extreme. Yeah. You know, if you got, if I know that this company is going to do better than every other company, their returns can be higher Then why, why own any other stock? Yeah, exactly. It's just ridiculous. You know, so except for, you know, the, the, the SEC requirements that you have to have at least 20, 20 stocks in a, yeah. 20 stocks in, 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 uh, in a fund to make it a fund. So you look at that and go, this is absolutely absurd that you'll have fun companies that do both. But why? Well, if you're, you know, feeling, you know, a little bit, you know, crazy and you want to jump in and, and engage in that process or have somebody manage that way, then you do this. Then if all of a sudden it doesn't do well, you jump over to here and then you move over to here. And that's what we have inside of this, these companies yeah. just moving from one area and one fund to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And then that's why investors they wonder, why do we get such bad returns in the stock market? Uh, guess what? It's because the fund companies are playing you as well. And you don't even realize it. You know, you might have a, a target date fund. Mm -hmm. And the holdings in that target date fund change over the years. And you don't even know it because you're not paying attention. And they're moving around from one thing to the other. And it's just, it's, uh, that's the game. And, yeah. And they have all five of those funds in the target date fund, owning those slightly different mixes of stocks. True. And that you know, yeah, true. You would at least expect you know an advisor, a broker, to avoid that and teach their clients and so forth. But here, these professional people have six six funds that own the same stock in their true target date fund, which is silly. I mean, you, they're oh, yeah. they're the fund company. They should know what's in those mutual <laughs> funds inside their mutual fund. <laughs> Go figure. Listening to the Investor Coaching Show, Paul Winkler, along with Evan Barnard and Ira Work, are going to take a quick break and be right back after this. Stay tuned. All right, you're listening to the Investor Coaching Show, Paul Winkler, Evan Barnard, on trumpet. <laughs> Investor coach and air trumpeter extraordinaire. <laughs> Not a real word. Okay. Um, man, there's so much to talk about. I've, I, I've got to get through some of this stuff. Uh, there's so much stuff to, to, to blab about, guys. Uh, annuities. Let's just do a quick, a quick thing on that. Because I don't want to spend too much time. It'll drive me crazy. Stop comparing annuity payouts to the 4% rule. David Blanchett, this was in Think Advisor. Now, 4% rule. The idea being that if you take a well-diversified portfolio based on Bill Bengen's research going back to 1900, and taking a portfolio and having large U.S. He started out with large U.S. stocks, long-term bonds, and I don't think cash was in the initial portfolio that I recall. And he was able to take 4% out over a 30-year period during virtually every time period and increase it for inflation, and it was fine. 91% 91 of the time it worked. And it was uh, – I, don't, I don't remember that there were any failures with that first that first portfolio. And as I remember the study, he was using the S&P 500 yes. and 20-year corporate bonds. Yes. Which is why I personally feel with all the new academic research that we have uh -huh. that that's a flawed study. It's the most commonly used study among it, financial it, advisors. I, I, I would agree with that, Ira. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And then, then what they did is they added small cap stocks. They were able to increase it to 4.6% when he added small caps. Then he added value stocks. And then he tried, what if we reduce the distribution in, after down years and increase the distribution after up years? And you know, there, there are all kinds of iterations of that study. But basically, that whole study was questioned and a few years ago. And it's lo and behold, it's just interesting. <laughs> Now the academics are going, no, it's just fine now. Um, you know, valuations are fine. And, uh, you know, they're back and forth. They're all over the place. Uh, but most of the time, the, the problem has been in how it was not actually implemented properly. Well, he's saying that, you know, a lot of times these annuity insurance people, 
So an annuity, basically the idea, you hand money to an insurance company and say, hey, pay me an income for the rest of my life. If I live two years, the money's gone. If I die and then the money's gone, if I've done a pure annuity the way they were actually, now there are all kinds of different variations based on that and they reduce the payout if they give you any bells and whistles above that but you know that's the idea a lot of people they don't still don't annuitize their annuities they just you know the research last i saw was like five percent yeah about yeah exactly evan that was about it so this guy's saying hey don't do this because what they're doing is they're saying hey compare this to our annuity that pays six percent and you can't compare that to a four percent you know a rule yeah. Just because you started out at a higher level, but you're realizing that what you're doing is you're spending down your own money with the annuity and you don't, you know, your heirs don't get to keep any of that stuff. Don't compare that. That is dishonest. And, you know, I thought that was well said. He says you're comparing apples to oranges, comparing the payout rate on a nominal annuity. 6.22 in the previous quote with a 4% is incredibly misleading, he says, uh, because they imply two very different things. 4% rule is real. Inflation-adjusted income benefit designed to last for some fixed period. Uh, in contrast, previously 6.22, SPIA, it's a single premium immediate annuity is what that stands for. SPIA, S-P-I-A. Payout rate is a nominal benefit lasts for life. Therefore, 4.6 would be more appropriate for comparison purposes is what he's saying there. Now, the issue is, is that it really depends on inflation whether that would be actually comparable. Because if you have more inflation, then your annuity, you're, you're basically looking at a benefit being paid from that insurance company that becomes worth less and less and less every year. But um, that is, I think it's good that the investing world, the financial planning world is pointing this out as being misleading. It's a step in the right direction. Anyway. Yeah. All right. So- one of the issues that I take with that is they show the higher interest rate for the annuity and the higher payment for the annuity than the 4% or even a 4.6%. Sure. sure. But what, the, what most agents don't tell you is that that's it. Right. That is all that payment's going to be. Yeah, that fixed dollar amount. Right. right. And when you look at a, a, a 6% a, of the original amount. Right. But when you look at a 4% or 4.6% or 4.25% of the same lump sum deposit, in a well-diversified portfolio, that will grow. It's historically grown. And Hey, you, keep complying here, will you? And, <laughs> right. I said, I, I, I said has. I didn't say well. Okay, all right. I said that has grown. <laughs> and in addition, you can begin to increase the income. Right. Which will eventually, could eventually yeah, 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 get yeah. above right. the 6% that you're getting from the annuity. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. No, that's a good point. I'm just messing with you. But yeah, and, and you know, this, the asset's still there and you look exactly. at it and go, hey, this is something still my kids inherit, whereas you get nothing right. the, the other direction. Or I want to yeah, take just a not... cruise and take a little bit more out this year. Oh, you fix know, excellent my roof. point. Excellent point. Or and, put a generator in. There you go. There you go. And, you know, it's just interesting because I think the other thing, too, is we're talking about it growing with an investment portfolio. Right. But the reality of it is a lot of times what people do is they spend more and more and more, and then they spend less, and then they spend more toward the tail end of their lives. you got a smile retirement. So the distribution is typically high when you first retire because you want to do the stuff you never got to do before. Mm -hmm. And then later on, you're, I've been there, done that, got the T-shirt. And then, you know, these kids are picking T-shirts up over at uh, at Goodwill and yeah. they're selling them for <laughs> – you see that? No. that That is the big thing right now, buying Re T-shirts for a it. buck and oh, then uh -huh. reselling them for more, and that's how they make money. These entrepreneurs. God bless Cal. Oh, isn't that lovely? So maybe I'll just sell my T-shirts. That's what they're that doing. I was going to bring over to Goodwill. Yeah. You, you want a Led Zeppelin 1976 <laughs> tour T-shirt? Okay, so there's somebody you, that's figured out where that thing is, <laughs> bought it, and they'll sell it to you All for right, hundred so bucks. I, I want to circle back to something just real quickly yes. before we go into the next topic. Yes. Uh, to something that I said when we were talking about that financial manager who okay. does what the client wants right, him right, to right. do versus us, who yeah. will try to coach our clients. We'll do whatever. You, we'll give you whatever you want. Okay, so I went back and I looked at our 7525 portfolio. I actually looked at my 7525 portfolio. Okay. And from January 1st of 2009, which was the first quarter was a really bad 
down market mm -hmm. through December 31st, the portfolio averaged 31.92%. Now, past performance is no guarantee of future results for our compliance people. Uh, however, if you had gotten out, you know, during that period or even before that period, let's say, you know, you got out somewhere in December or November of 2008, you missed that nearly 32%. But if you weren't back in the portfolio on March 10th, the day the market started to go back up, that portfolio did 75.42% mm -hmm. for that nine month, nine and a half month period. If you waited until June to get that sounds back about right. in, yes. Okay, you waited till June, so you had seven months. You got twenty one point five four percent. He, he, Evan's just going. It's eight and a half months, but <laughs> no, no, I was going. You lost about forty seven percent oh, okay, of the sure. return. Yeah, even more. You well, you, you lost fifty four percent of the return. Mm -hmm. And this is the reason why we don't work like that manager was saying, well, we just build a portfolio the way you want us to build a portfolio. Good point. We help our clients stay disciplined. We talk them off the ledge in a year like 2008 or a year when like coronavirus is driving down the market uh, or any kind of news that causes the market to go down. Yeah. We work with our clients to help keep them on that path Knowing that, hey, you got another 25, 30, 40 years that this money has to work. Well, and you also have trade, you know, if you look at the rebalancing of a portfolio and you do it with cash flows, there are things going on every day that you're just not going to do. Right. And rebalancing is incredibly difficult because you're selling something that just did well and everybody's talking about how great it is <laughs> and buying something that just did less well and nobody's talking about, you know, so it is just from a whole standpoint of discipline, it is really, it's an uphill climb. It is really hard to do that.